first thing I want to do is review the word totalitarianism. A lot of T's. Because someone from yesterday, it's on the other sheet, the other Google Doc rather, remind me of what totalitarianism means. Yeah, state control, meaning government control over every aspect of your life. Which way you go to school, what you learn in school, what you see on TV, what music you're allowed to listen to, what job you're going to have, how much food you're allowed to eat, I kid you not, what religion you're allowed to have, every one of those decisions is made for you by the government. Okay? And that government has one political party and one dictator in power. So it's not, like a, situ it's not a situation where you can vote that person out of office, and it's not a situation in which there's checks and balances placed upon that leader. Your rights are goodbye. The section one here says, great purges in the police state. Let's just talk about the word purge. What does it mean to purge something? Yeah, you're, you're eliminating oh, like something, right? If I, if I purge up my food, right, I'm puking it up. If I'm purging a person, I'm getting rid of that person. Stalin, just like Robespierre during the French Revolution, wanted to purge anyone in society who he thought would be a challenge to his authority. So you could do that, by using a secret police force, right? What did a secret police force do to try to make sure that we're eliminating people who are a threat? Monitoring telephone lines. What's another thing they watched closely or looked at, comma, mail? All right, so again, if you can monitor the phone lines and read the mail and find words that you don't like as a government that might be a threat to you, you could just have those people purged, arrested, or executed. Okay, with the intent of, again, try, the purpose of a totalitarian government is to do whatever you can to maintain power at the expense of the people. What do we call this great purge? Campaign, very good, to eliminate anyone who would be a threat to Stalin's power. It's very possible that on your Regents exam, I might ask you a question, what's one thing similar between Robespierre and Stalin? They both used fear and violence to get rid of people who they thought they were a threat. So you kill people that are a threat, that leads to some other effects. What happens as a result? Millions of people dead, are there any other effects? Stalin gained total control. Yes. And Communist Party. Right? Any and all threats were eliminated. No one was going to challenge his authority, no checks and balances, no elections. It's Stalin for life. Stalin will rule the Soviet Union from the time of Lenin's death up until 1953. A lot of things happened in that span of years. Great Depression, World War II, uh, the beginnings of the Korean War begin in 1953 as well. Let me ask you this. One of the things that Stalin did was he thought that his generals, the military generals, would be the, a big threat to him. Right, because military generals have the loyalty of the troops. If anyone might be a threat, it'd be the people who control the army, right? Because they could seize power by force. So Stalin removed many of his top generals in this great purge. What effect do you think that might have on the Soviet military? Weaken it. And when we fast forward to World War II, the first couple of years of World War II for the Soviet Union went really poorly because the top smart military generals had been purged under Stalin. So we're going to add that here. Top generals were purged, which negatively affected the Soviet military. You'll see too, and we're gonna, we're gonna unfortunately see a lot of purges in history the rest of the school year. Another group that they typically like to go after as a threat are teachers and intellectuals, right? People who know things, right? Teachers know about things like enlightenment ideas and democracy and know what America is doing. That's a threat. Right? If I'm in a Soviet classroom and I tell the kids, hey, you guys know in America there's elections? And they would just vote Stalin out of office if he was being a horrible leader. That's a threat to the power of Stalin, right? So we gotta get rid of that teacher, right? Which would maybe negatively affect the education system and impact all the learning and maybe the technology of that country, right? It all connects together. Let's move to box two. Controlling the hearts and minds of the people, right? Manipulation. This is stuff we've talked about already at length. How does Stalin or any totalitarian leader control the media? Yeah, it's all about that censorship, right? Prevents the media from talking about things that might be a threat to the government, right? All news media in a communist country is run and owned by the government. If you put the news on while you're hanging out in China, the government approved everything that's being shown. Do you think the news channel is gonna be able to talk smack about the government? Absolutely not. 
right? Because that will be a threat to the power of that government. So they restrict the bad information and only show you the good. That's what censorship is all about. And they do things to give you ideas, to put ideas in your head about maybe how great and wonderful the country is and maybe how evil the rest of the world is. What do they do to control people's thoughts? What do they put out for you to see? Yeah, government issues propaganda right, to make you believe certain things. Propa Anti-American propaganda, anti-German propaganda, propaganda that makes the government look great. Right, let's make, let's make Stalin statues and put them all over the Soviet Union. Let's, let's get artists to paint him and make him look like a god. All right, so all these things. Stalin's really interesting too as far as his face goes. The man had smallpox and he lived through it. And when he lived through it, when it was over, he had all these like, like craters on his face that he was really self-conscious about, it's like scars. scars. So he was always super paranoid about making sure his face was airbrushed in pictures and make sure that you know, he looked all wonderful and had no flaws. He was so concerned about his image to the people, didn't want to show any signs of weakness or, or, uh, or, or stuff like that. Okay, what about religion? How are we controlling religion in the Soviet Union? Yeah, Stalin purged religious leaders from the USSR and encouraged people to worship the government. And the Soviet Union, guys, was a massive place. Right? If you go to the western part of the Soviet Union, you're going to find Christians. You go to the eastern part, you're right by Mongolia and China. So in that one place, you got Christians, you got Jews, you got Muslims. Right? So the Soviet Union is trying to unify the people. Right? We shouldn't be loyal to Allah, to Muhammad, to Jesus, to Moses, to Confucius, to Buddha. No, 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 no. Right? We're all going to be one group of people and we're going to put away all those old school beliefs and just put our faith and worship and, and, and to the leader, right? Joseph Stalin himself, he's going to be your new God. Atheism is what they push for in communist countries. You guys know atheism, right? Not believing in God, right? That's the official state policy. Good. One of the things that's kind of interesting, and this kind of goes along with parts one and two here. If I have time after the break, I will show you guys a couple of video clips about photography in the Soviet Union, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Right, you guys know what it means to Photoshop something, right? You're like editing a photo. Well, long before computers and Photoshop, Stalin employed people to manipulate like camera film, if you even know what those words mean. I don't even know. Like, do you guys know what film is for a camera? Like those pieces of plastic that photos used to go on? This probably sounds like a foreign language to you guys. So before computers and technology, they still knew. I, don't ask me how, I have no idea. I could barely do it with Photoshop. Eliminate people. This is a very famous example of that. This was the guy who was the leader of like the Soviet Navy. I don't remember exactly what he did to get on Stalin's bad side, but they collected all those pictures and then reissued it without the guy in there. So not only are you purging your leaders, you're erasing them from history, right? Because if you saw that, if, if people knew that that person got purged, they might question the government, right? Oh, maybe, um, you know, what happened to that guy? How come he's not around anymore? Maybe the government is pretty bad. Well, if we erase him from existence as if he never even was alive, maybe no one would know about it, right? We, won't, we wouldn't question the government so much. A lot of crazy pictures like that of Stalin with people and then all of a sudden that picture's out again but without that person. So now we're gonna control not only the minds of the people, the religion of the people, we're not just gonna control who gets to live and die, we're gonna control the business world. Command economy, box three. Can someone tell me about a command economy? Government makes all economic decisions. And I know it sounds kind of weird, like, well, what does that mean? Economic decisions are, what kind of factories are we gonna have? What is going to be made in those factories? Where will the factories be? Who's going to be hired? How much do we charge? All those types of decisions are made not by individual business owners anymore, they're made by the government. So let me ask you this, if the government runs the factory, what do you think they're more likely going to prioritize in that factory? The making of weapons or the making of Gucci belts, right? And that's the thing in communism, guys, like blue jeans, like stupid Wranglers and Levi's, right? We think nothing of them. People, there was a black market to import Levi's jeans into the Soviet Union because you couldn't get fancy clothing in the Soviet Union. They didn't prioritize that, right? They took all the people's talents and resources and finances to put into things that might benefit the country, like the space program, nuclear weapons, guns and tanks. They didn't care about Gucci, right? They prioritized whatever was going to defend the country, not your personal fashion, right? There's no Snapchat in communism. 
cool. So as you do, if you're the R Russians and you're trying to be modern, you might set some goals for like growth. Hence the five year plans here, right? We talked about with the czar that Russia was kind of far behind the times. So the next couple of Russian leaders, whether it's Lenin or Stalin, have to catch Russia up. So what's the goal behind these five year plans? What are they looking to achieve? Increase output of coal, iron, steel, and electricity. And in parentheses next to that, I want you to add the phrase industrial goods. Consumer goods are the things that you and I buy in a store. A Gucci belt, an iPhone 13 Pro Max, so you can flex to your friends and get the big phone. Industrial goods are the things that businesses buy or that governments use to produce other things. If I produce steel, I can now build a building. I can now lay down railroad track. I can now build a tank, right? Those are the things that are more important for a government, not so much the iPhone, not so much the Gucci belt or the Nike Airs, whatever they might be, right? They don't care about those things. And they had some success, right? If you looked at the charts, and this kind of ties into the next question here, in terms of steel production, if you look at this chart, it went up slowly over time. It's definitely improving. Coal production goes through the roof, All right? So that's a success. So can you, can you guys tell me for the next, ne the next question here, the positive effects of the five-year plan? Coal and steel production increased. Any negatives? Livestock went down. Do you guys know what livestock is? Animals, your farm animals. So if you look at this chart here, I'll put the, the answers back up in a second. Livestock took a drastic tumble. And there are more historical circumstances we're gonna see in a second that explain why livestock went down. But that was the ultimate goal of the five-year plan. Increase industry, increase agriculture. We had some successes. Food went up a little bit, then it goes down a little bit. It goes up a little bit, it goes down a little bit. So it's uh, kind of like inconsistent growth. Livestock took a tumble and then slowly climbs back up. So mixed success for the five-year plans. We'll talk more about in a second of why the farming and the animals didn't grow as much as industry did. But nevertheless, there was some success there. All right, let's head to box four. Tell me about collective farms, large government-owned farms, right? This is communism. Before communism, you owned your own land. Communism, there is no private property. So what the government did was they took all the people's land and they joined them together to make massive, super huge farms owned by the government. And they just told all the poor people, hey, you guys wanted a place to live? Here, you can now live on government land. And your only job is to work together to grow food for your country. We'll come and stop by once per week and we'll take a huge chunk of it and give it to the people to support industry and to support cities and we'll let you keep what we think you deserve. There is no working for money in communism. You work for the government and they determine how much you should be able to keep based on whatever evaluation they have of that. Kind of sketchy, right? Some people might resist this, even like without having done box four. Who do you think would have a problem with this idea that the government is gonna take land away and give it to poor people? Wealthy people, whether they're peasants or anybody else. So one group in particular that resisted this process of collecting all the farms and making them owned by the government, that's what collectivization is, is wealthy peasants from Ukraine, there's the Ukrainians again, called Kulaks. What a name, okay? Conflict between Russians and Ukrainians has been going on for a long time. Ukraine was an independent country. Now the Soviet Union takes over Ukraine. Ukrainians used to own their own land. Now the government says, you can't have that anymore. It's ours. You're probably gonna resist that, or at least you're gonna try if you have any pride in you know, your, your lifestyle and you don't want your government taking it over. Did anyone happen to catch how the Kulaks resisted the government when they tried to take the land away? Yeah, when the government came, the Kulaks murdered all their animals, destroyed all the food and burned down all the farms. They'd rather, it see, they'd rather it be destroyed than turn it over to the government. Okay, not all the Kulaks did that, but a lot of them did. And that helps explain why there's this massive drop off in livestock. Because a lot of them were just killed off. And wheat production was inconsistent when it comes to the growth. All right, so what happens after that is to punish the Kulaks, the government would show up and take away all the food that the Kulaks produced. Right, it used to be before that, that they would let the people keep some of the food that they grew on the farms. Now the government collects all the food and doesn't let them eat any of it. 
What do you think happened to the Kulaks? They have no food to eat. What do you think happened to the Kulaks? They starved to death. Okay, this is known as the Ukrainian forced famine. It's a genocide conducted by the Soviet Union against Ukrainians for resisting the power of the government. So the effects, millions of people die of famine.